Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Simon Jackman, Professor of Political Science and the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. And welcome to another webinar. This one's extraordinarily special for us. Um, we're drawing on our, our great friend, uh, distinguished ambassadorial fellow at the United States Study Center, uh, Joe Hockey. Joe, of course, uh, still in Washington, uh, now founding partner and president of Bondi Partners after his, uh, his term as uh, Australia's ambassador in the United States and a truly fascinating time to serve in that role. Uh, and of course, um, in joining Joe in conversation um, um, is Mick Mulvaney. Uh, Mick serves as currently as uh, United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland, uh, but critically for today's conversation, uh, he served as Acting White House Chief of Staff from January 2019 until March 2020, where Joe darkened his door considerably, but uh, the truth be told, a, a, a great relationship was established and, uh, and one that, that served Australia's national interests ex extre extremely well, and, and in a way continues to do so, even though uh, both gentlemen have moved on to, uh, to other offices now. And, and it's through that that uh, Joe reached out to Mick and, and got this amazing opportunity for us today, uh, an hour of uh, conversation uh, between between Joe and Mick. Before the role at the White House, of course, uh, Mick Mulvaney was Director of OMB, that's the Office of Management and Budget, uh, from February 2017, early in, in the Trump administration, until March 2020 as well. He was nominated as OMB Director, of course, by uh, President Donald Trump-elect during the interregnum, during the transition back in December of 16. And of course, prior to that, uh, Mick uh, served uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives for six years, uh, uh, representing uh, his district from the state of South Carolina. Um, I want to quickly get out of the way and devote as much time we've got today to Joe in conversation with Mick. Thank you both gentlemen for uh, this hour you're giving the United States Study Center uh, tonight. Um, over to you, Joe. Well, thank you, Simon. Great to be associated with the United States Study Center. You do a great job have a great team and I really appreciate it. Mick, great to catch up again. Thank you, you're beaming in from whereabouts? Uh, some, some place in South uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Last time they told me it was a swing state, so we're here campaigning. Right, and Pencil Pennsylvania is a crucial state on, uh, on election night. I mean, basically if Donald Trump doesn't win Pennsylvania and Florida, then uh, it's probably game over, but we can get into that a bit. Uh, but thanks for your time, uh, Michael. Uh, I know it's precious and uh, you've just come back from Ireland as well. I'm aware of that. So it's great that you could join us. Um, 14 days to go. Donald Trump is consistently around eight to nine points behind in the national polls. On every measure, he looks like he's heading towards a thumping defeat. Uh, he hasn't won a poll anywhere across the country. Uh, it seems as though he is off message. Uh, talking about Fauci today and, uh, uh, and uh, locking up Hunter Biden and a range of other things, which certainly are not the issues that you would think would persuade swing voters to come over to his side in the last few days. Uh, what's your read of the current situation and how is the White House reacting to the challenges? Yeah, I think what you're seeing is, uh, is <clears throat> the only thing I think you said that is not factually accurate deals with uh, swing voters. There aren't any. Um, I, I think that the one thing we've learned in the last couple of weeks is that there are no swing voters left. There's no undecided voters. It would be hard for anybody who's actually going to take the time to vote um, to, to understand how they could possibly be undecided. If they follow politics enough to vote, they, they've probably already made up their mind. I talked to Frank Luntz, he's a good friend of mine, the pollster. He did a poll, he did a focus group, I think after the first um, uh, presidential debate and then again after the first vice presidential debate. And I asked him what the takeaway was and he said the takeaway was it doesn't make any difference. There are no undecided voters at all. What you've got then, and it's just early, that happens in American politics, it just usually happens um, five or six days out where you transition away from persuasion into motivation. 
which is why I think you're seeing what you're seeing out of the president. He's not interested in swaying suburban uh, female voters in southeastern Pennsylvania because those folks have already made up their mind. Either they're going to vote for him or they are not. He just wants to make sure his folks show up to vote. So I think that's why you're seeing the, the, the various um, uh, messages come out of the, uh, come out of the campaign. Um, is it right? I, I think it probably is. Um, again, I, once you work in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C., Joe, as you and I did, it's sort of hard to, to look at the country through the perspective of the ordinary folks. But even with that bias that you and I bring to this, face it, politics has become a pastime. It's become a sport in, in, in the United States. People follow politics all the time. There's a reason that Fox News is the number one rated cable news show in television and MSNBC is second on, a, on any given night. People follow this stuff. And if you follow it, you've made up your mind. So I, I don't think it's a mistake. We talk more about polling tonight. We talk about national polls, which of course are completely meaningless. Those of folks who are watching us who yeah. don't know, we, we don't use national polls. We don't have a national election. We have, we have 50 state elections on election night. So national polls are just they're, uh, not worth anything. And Donald Trump wasn't leading a poll at all until uh, when he won in 2016. So, but we get a chance to talk about all of that. But the, the bottom line is, I think you're seeing what you're seeing because the transition, the campaign has transitioned from persuasion to motivation. But I, I, I don't know how that gels with Donald Trump saying two days ago to suburban women, I need you to vote for me. I'm your guy. Uh, or when he came out of the White House after the bout with COVID, he said directly to the community, I'm a senior. It's going to surprise all of you, but I'm a senior. I mean, not many people know I'm a senior, but I'm a senior and I'm one of you. Right? <laughs> that was one of the more bizarre statements. So, yeah. I mean, you know, he is trying, he, he knows he is bleeding on seniors and he's bleeding on suburban women. So if you say that it's all about getting your people out to vote, why is he appealing directly to those people? Yeah, I, I, bleeding. You're looking at the same polls. Let me give you an, an example of polling that you've seen, okay? You've seen a poll because it made national news, I don't know, about two or three weeks ago that said that Biden had pulled ahead of Trump decisively in Arizona, all right? That, that was yeah. a headline here for a while, made a bunch of news, right? Because it's a swing state and if Biden is truly winning in Arizona, that, that's, that's, that is newsworthy. Uh, I know a lot of people in Arizona. I used to serve with many of them when I was in the United States House. So I called one of them and I said, uh, David, uh, does that feel right to you? He goes, absolutely not. I said, can you get me the poll? He says, I absolutely can. In fact, I've already got it. And he sent it to me. So I looked at the poll that was the basis for this story. And what the poll said was that Biden had pulled ahead of Trump by more than the margin of error amongst registered voters. Okay, fair enough. But if you looked at the poll, and you've seen them as much as I have, Joe, you look at the poll another 10 pages back, it has likely voters and talks about the yeah. difference between registered and likely. And Donald Trump was winning uh, over Joe Biden by outside the margin of error amongst registered voters, excuse me, amongst likely voters. My headline, if I was writing a headline, trying to be fair and accurate and balanced would have been Arizona too close to call. But the story that you and everybody else heard was that Biden had pulled ahead. Again, not a false headline, not factually inaccurate, just not entirely the truth. And that has been replicated it, it, again it, and that again. That doesn't explain why Donald Trump had those specific words at targeting seniors, the specific words targeting suburban women. I mean, as you know, you don't normally go out and, I mean, I, I think it's impressive when candidates actually ask the question, you know, would you vote for me? Or I need you to vote yeah. for me, directly asking the question. Yeah, you have to do it at the end of a campaign, it. that's right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, we used to do it in our pre-selections in Australia primaries here, where you ask someone directly, I need, I need your vote. Will you vote for me? And it is a sign that that vote really matters. And I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking closely at Florida, not so much Arizona, but more Florida, where there is an older population, where there was a surge in coronavirus, and where there was a suggestion that older voters were changing their minds. Um, yeah. But, you know, it... it why don't, why don't we just out of that segue to, um, you know, uh, to registrations? I mean, the Republicans actually, a lot of people aren't familiar with the fact that the Republicans have actually done a really good job in getting more uh, new uh, Republican registered voters in some of the key states. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. In fact, I'm, I'm in one of them. Um, the Republican over Democrat advantage for new registrations since the last election is about 200,000 people here in Pennsylvania. Uh, put that in perspective. This is a state the president won by about 40,000 votes in 2016. Um, the, the campaign, by the way, uh, great campaigns do this. Uh, this is what Barack Obama did 
to Mitt Romney in 2012. He simply out-organized and out-campaigned him. Obama was good at it. Trump is great at it in terms of harvesting data. And of course, as technology evolves, the ability to harvest data becomes even more refined. And uh, you know, we've been doing uh, rallies for months, in fact, years when I was in the White House. And people always said, why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you campaigning now? It's way too early. We were harvesting data. Uh, we did a, um, uh, very telling, we did a, uh, I don't know if I ever told you the story or not, we did a, a rally in El Paso, Texas, right after the 2018 election. And this was when Don, um, Ted Cruz almost lost to Beto O'Rourke in a Senate race. Yeah, yeah. Right after, on the heels of that, we're doing a rally in El Paso. And the press are calling me and say, oh, oh, you, so you're admitting that, that Texas is in play and Trump might lose Texas. I'm like, no, no, we're going to win Texas by about 10 or 12 points. It's New Mexico we're interested in. And they're like, well, but El Paso's not in Texas. I'm like, well, go look at a map and you'll see that El Paso sits on the border between Texas and New Mexico. And the biggest arena we could find in that demographic area was in El Paso. And we filled that room. Not only did we fill it, we had four or five times as many people sign up online. And that's where the data mining begins. What do we know about that group of people who signed up to see the president in El Paso, Texas? More than half of them were Hispanic. More than half of them, in fact, 60% of them were not registered as Republicans. They were either Democrats or unregistered or independents. We also knew that more than half of them were what we call in our country, one of four voters. And what that means is we track you, a, a likely voter is somebody who votes all the time. An unlikely voter is somebody who doesn't vote all the time. So we track them in terms of one of four, two of four, three of four, four of four. And that means how many of the last national presidential elections have you voted in? And half of the people there, more than half, were one of four voters, which means they didn't vote in 02, uh, excuse me, they didn't vote in 04, they didn't vote in uh, 08, they didn't vote in 12, and they voted in 16. This is who comes out for Donald Trump, people who don't vote in other elections. In fact, one of the reasons I think the Republicans lost control of the House in 2018 is that 8 million, 8 million Trump voters did not vote in those midterm elections. That's typical for us in this country, but it's not, it's not that marked of, of a distinction. Um, so Trump drives people to the polls that other people simply don't. But we have all those. We have over 100 million emails and phone numbers to talk to people between now and election to make. I get them. I get, in fact, I've got three of them while I'm sitting here on the phone. If you haven't voted, vote early. If you need to vote, call this number. If you, if you haven't registered yet and you still can register in your state, et cetera, et cetera. You want to mail in, do this. So that, that data-driven stuff is we are better at it than the Democrats now. And I say that fully admitting they were better at it um, than we were in 2012. I do think um, if the president wins, and as I sit here tonight, I think that he will. We could talk more about that. It will be because of the ground game as much as anything else. And he, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there is no doubt that he's being massively outspent by the Biden campaign at the moment. But there was a lot of money. He, as you rightly say, he started campaigning immediately after. I mean, the the inauguration ceremony was the beginning of the re-election campaign for Donald Trump, effectively. Um, but I always used to laugh when people said, Is, do you really think he's going to run for re-election? I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. Are you serious? I, Come on. I heard, I heard, I heard, I read some commentary by someone in the, the Australian media suggesting that he might not run. And it was just, yeah. Uh, yeah. At any rate, so, but he was always going to run. He's, he's running as hard as he can and, and at a speed three times warp speed compared to Joe Biden, who's basically not doing any campaigning at the moment, uh, very little campaigning actually, in his preparation for the debate on Thursday. But just coming back to the early, the, the registrations, I mean, you know, we are seeing a very large early turnout with, with, with early voting. Um, the, the, the one statistic that keeps coming back is people are speculating that you're gonna get 150 million voters which is a massive increase on, on, on the last election. Yep. Um, do, you, do you expect that sort of massive turnout? And it's always been said that the bigger the turnout, the more it helps the Democrats. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that last statement. Um, right. I, I do think you're probably right that we're going to see record turnout. Certainly you would expect under any election circumstance, in any election under these circumstances, to have more early voting because of COVID. So that, that doesn't surprise me. What I've been more interested to see, Joe, is the, 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 the party affiliation of those who have voted already. Um, in that well, Florida state. does report that. So Florida do. does. A lot, a lot of states do. Yeah, a lot and, of states. And, and, and 51% are Democrat, 29% right. are Republican, and 20% are Independent. Yeah, and so in that, an ordinary that year, 
In an ordinary yeah. year, Republicans typically do better than Democrats in Florida, for example, on mail-in voting. But it was anticipated that this year, because of the different dynamics with COVID and the outpush, the, the, the outreach that Democrats had done, to see numbers as high as 80% uh, Democrat in the early days. You're not seeing that. I think it's very difficult to predict an outcome under these circumstances based upon the early voting right. because there's no apples to apples comparison with last time. If you want to look at 16 and the Republicans did much better in early voting in 16 than they did in 12, right. I think that was a barometer of what, what you could see on election night. I think this year you throw all that stuff out because it's just so different with, with COVID and with all the media attention to voting. Um, you know, I saw some polling data the other day that said, you know, uh, Trump, um, Trump voters are uh, uh, folks who are going to vote on election day are 60-40 for the president and folks who are going to vote early are 60-40 for Biden. They're meaningless numbers because you just don't know who's going to vote um, and who's not. But the real question to your point is, uh, are these folks who are, who are going to vote anyway or, and we're going to see a, a total that's roughly what you would accept, expect to see in line with previous elections or are we going to see that dramatic spike? Um, in, in new voters. And I don't really answer that question. I don't think anybody does. You know, I, I want to touch on this issue about the shy Trump voter, because I think it's very real. that There are some people that won't respond to polls. They don't want to talk about it because they get shouted at whenever they talk about Donald Trump or defend Donald Trump. And I was down in North Carolina uh, at uh, Nag's Head last week. And, uh, and, and, you know, there was the odd... Um, you know, keep America great hat or make America great hat, whatever, T-shirts. And a, a few people would say, gee, I like that hat or I like that T-shirt, you know, quietly say it, hoping no one else would hear them say that. And it sort of gnawed away at me as I kept thinking about the fact that, you know, it, it, now even more than last election, I think people are being shouted at if they actually are Donald Trump supporters or they're going to vote for Donald Trump which is probably reflected in one of the recent polls that said that 56% of Americans think their neighbor's gonna vote for Donald Trump uh, as opposed to themselves. They're gonna vote for Joe Biden, but 56% think Donald Trump, uh, the neighbor's gonna vote for Donald Trump. Yeah, I think it's really hard. I think, I think Trump, I think, I think polls still have value. Um, and I think that, but I do not think the value is in predicting outcomes. Um, certainly they saw that in Brexit, you folks saw it in your last national election. Sure. Polls were just, they, they were not capable of, of predicting an outcome. Certainly that was the case with us in 2016. There have been myriad elections since then. Uh, the two that come to mind are Ron DeSantis ran for governor uh, of Florida. Rick Scott ran for senator uh, of, of Florida at the same time. They were both down seven points according to the polling data going into the week before the election and they both won. I think polling really has lost that ability to predict an outcome. And the really, really good pollsters are asking those other questions to try and, and sort of get hints of what the truth are. And your question but, is, is it good about who's your neighbor going to vote for? Who do you think is going yeah. to win the election? Yeah, those yeah, yeah. Are valuable ways to look at it. So let's, let's, let's move on from polls. I mean, polls schmolls, as we always said, particularly when we- Unless you're winning. If you're winning, they're fantastic. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, that's, that's right. The, the, the uh, um, you know, what, what's, what's coming through writ large at the moment is Donald Trump has a lot of energy. I mean, as you used to say to me, uh, you know, we had to hold him back, you know, from trying to do two or three rallies a day. Um, but I think there is something infectious about this energy that yeah. he is showing out there at the moment. And Joe Biden is still running the, um, you know, very heavily managed, very regulated, uh, campaign. And primarily, that, I assume that's because Donald Trump is running against Donald Trump. Uh, and, you know, Joe Biden's happy to, 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 to run a campaign where the focus is on Donald Trump. Yeah. The question in my mind is, is energy enough? I mean, I get frustrated when, uh, you know, he's not talking about tax or he's not talking about border protection. Or he's not talking about manufacturing or I mean, he's just almost abandoned the narrative about policies. And he's talking about Fauci, he's talking about Hunter Biden. He's talking about all the things that, frankly, a lot of swing voters don't, don't care about. You're saying, to be perfectly clear, you're saying this is all about getting people out to vote rather than actually trying to convince them to vote his way. And the question in my mind is, is it too late for that? 
Well, is it too late? Um, let, me, let, me, let me start where you started, which is his rallies and his energy and, and why I got asked a question the other day as to whether or not I thought that was a good use of his time uh, in, in these particular states. And I said, well, absolutely. The president has an ability to drive people to the polls, um, the likes of which we've not seen since, since Ronald Reagan. I, we were, uh, I was chief of staff uh, when we were involved in a special election or off election in, uh, in North Carolina. There was a vacancy there and it was a very tight race, um, a swing district, um, a true swing district, could have gone either way. And the um, president goes, do you really wanna go down and speak to this? And Mr. President, this, this election will be so tight that you will probably speak to enough people the night before the election to make a difference. And that night we flew down uh, to rural North Carolina, he spoke to 7,000 people and the margin of victory for the Republican the next day was 4,000 votes. You see the same thing going back in 2016. He went to Michigan at midnight the night before election day uh, in 2016. And he won Michigan by I think 20,000, no, 8,000 votes. I think it was a very, in, the, in, the, in the high single digits in, in Michigan. If he had gone to Minnesota and given two more rallies, he might've won Minnesota, which he lost by 40,000 votes. It just, it's, it, it is a phenomenon. It just is, I, I can't explain it, but he uh, drives people to the polls in ways that ordinary politicians don't. Um, so I, I understand the criticisms and I get it. If you're going by the textbook, he's making all the mistakes that, that the textbook advisors would tell you not to make. The point of the matter is it worked for him in 2016 and he's willing to ride it out again in, in 2020. Um, the, uh, it's, and I think by the way, uh, it's a wonderful story. I'm, I'm in Southeast Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, it's actually this district that I'm in right now that convinced me on election day in 2016 that Donald Trump was going to win. I have a friend of mine who used to be the Congressman here and he texted me on election day, 2016, about 10 o'clock in the morning and said, Donald Trump is going to be president. And of course, at that time, I was sort of where you are. I was like, Donald Trump doesn't have a chance because the media told me Donald Trump didn't have a chance. And I didn't have an insight into the campaign like I do now. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a miracle. How the hell do you know that, Scott? And what Scott said was, I just voted. It's 958 and I just voted at my home precinct and I was voter number 1,257. I'm like, so what? And he said, in 2012, only 900 people voted in this precinct all day. By the end of the day, that precinct had twice the turnout it had in 2016. And there are people who just showed up for Donald Trump. It's hard to measure that. It's hard to pull that. You and I both know that pollsters don't want to talk to people who might not vote. They want to talk to people who tell them they are absolutely going to vote. And folks like that tend not to get counted. So the shy, the shy um, you know, look, put it in a very real sense. I have family in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have family who live in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have down, family who could look out their windows during the riots and see buildings burning. Do you really think they're gonna put a Trump sign in their front yard? You, you put a Trump a sticker on their car? No, that, that won't, but, so, but, but he is as good at, dr at driving out voters for him as he is at driving out uh, voters for his opponents yeah, too. Yeah, but so, you, you, know, you know, I mean, you've done this before. Like yeah, it, it does, but you know that positive energy is more powerful than negative energy. People will show up for somebody that, excuse me, I have to sneeze. <laughs> You're right. Apologies. Thank you. You and I both know that, that, that voting for something is more motivating than voting against something. Is Donald Trump going to drive record Democrat turnout? Yes, he is. Is he going to drive Republican turnout record, at a record level? Yes, he is. It's possible that the loser in this, in fact, I think it's likely that the loser in this race will get more votes than any other candidate in the history of our country, with the exception of the person who wins. Okay, so and, and and even Biden may get more votes than than Trump and still lose the election because of the way our system works. Yeah, 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 and and we get that. I think um, so. Let's just agree uh, that that you know, at the moment Donald Trump is behind. I mean, I think I think we can agree on that, can't we? Well, what did I agree? What did I agree to that? Uh, well, what, what's your base? Your basis for the watching too much CNN? You really are. <laughs> Hardly, I, you you have no friends on television at the moment. So let's just <laughs> let's just stick with it. Let's, let's just that. stick with the consensus, the betting market, the polls. Yeah. Anecdotally, you know, let's just run with that. Okay. Um, what what does Donald Trump really, in your view? Now I'm I'm putting you on the hook. What does Donald Trump need to do between now and polling day to get across the line? I think, he's, I think he's doing it. Um, I, I think the rallies are the best way for him to spend his time. I really do. I understand. I don't know how they're doing it because I used to run this part of the White House. I understand they're doing three and four a day. 
uh, starting uh, late this week for the rest of the campaign. That's nearly impossible to pull off when you have to deal with the security team, the, the footprint, the size of which you have for the President of the United States. How they're doing it, I do not know, but they tell me they're doing three and four a day, which is, again, it's, it's critical to the, to, to the White House. You and I will talk a little bit more about the Senate and the House later on, yes. some of the governor's races and so forth. But th that's what he does. It's what he, he does well. He, so th so uh, they're, the, they're the tactics. But what is he going to say? What, you know, what, is he, what does he need to say to the American people? You know, I, I, I wish he would talk more. I, I'm not against him firing up the base. I don't think that's a mistake. Um, I, it would not bother me for him to come out and say, this is what, this is what you're going to get from Joe Biden. This is what you're going to get from me. Okay. To your point, I never, liked, I never liked his chances in a Trump versus Trump election because by that definition, Trump could be on the losing side. Trump versus Biden, he stands to do much, much better. Yeah, come out and yeah. say, put it, put it in Trump terms, not talk about policy. I've been out working during COVID and Joe Biden has been in the basement. And the people yeah. who are voting for me have been out working while the people who are voting for Joe Biden, the professors and the, and the, t and the, and the reporters have been living in their basement. This is yeah. a choice for the country to make. I think that's... That would, I'd like to see him do more of that. Uh, and he may well in next week. I'd be curious to see um, the message that he delivers uh, at the debate uh, on Thursday night, his last, you know, the last debate, assuming it takes place. Uh, which and it'll be a different Donald Trump to the first debate, won't it? I mean, oh, I don't, it could be. It, could, it wouldn't surprise me if it was the exact same as last time. So Frank once said, you know, you, you referred to Frank, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, we sat on the balcony here and and had a couple of drinks, you and Frank and I, the other night. And Frank was going, pulling his hair out, saying, look, we, we're really, you know, <laughs> what's, what's left of it? <laughs> pulling his hair out, saying, this guy needs to be disciplined about what he says. He's got to change yeah. his words. And, of course, he, Frank was quite emotional after the first debate, saying, what a disaster. He lost middle America. He lost any chance of getting those people that are swing voters in key states. So Frank would say a complete change is the only way he's going to make something in the last debate. You're saying... So I'll answer, I'll answer what this he way. Watched. So, um, by the way, that's the exact same message that Frank Luntz had for the president in 2016 when he was running. Uh, and I knew that because Frank and I were and still are close friends. And yeah. the one conversation I had with Paul Manafort, I only had one in my entire life. We got together with the House Freedom Caucus, which at the time included Mark Meadows, a good friend of mine, Jim Jordan, a couple of names folks might know. And we met with Paul Manafort at the Capitol Hill Club. This was late in the, in the election, probably late September. I can't remember if the Access Hollywood tape had come out yet or not, but it was late in the election. And we all, to a man, gave that exact same message to Paul Manafort. And Paul very politely, but very directly said, let me, hold on a second, guys, let me ask you a question. How many of you just won a Republican primary for president? Nobody, nobody? Okay, the president's gonna do it his way. And that's it, because it, it worked for him last time, and he's riding out because that's who he is. That's the message for Frank Luntz. You are not going to change the president. One of the things I think I did successfully in the West Wing when I was chief is that we were never going to try and change the president. John Kelly tried every day to change the president. You're not going to do it. He's 70-odd years old. You think he's 74 now. He's very successful. You're not going to convince him that everything he's done up to now is wrong and he has to do something different. If he changes his mind, it's because he changes his mind. But you're not going to be able to convince him to do that. So, it, you know, one of the criticisms I've had of him is that he has no one around him who is giving him the honest advice. And what you're saying is really it's futile to try and do that. No, 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 that's not, that's, uh, honest advice is, is, is different. Um, the, to sit down with the president and say, Mr. President, this, 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 and this, to tell the president stuff he doesn't want to hear, that is absolutely critical. And in fact, it's the chief of staff's primary job. He asked me one time, Nick, how would you define the job? I'm like, Mr. President, I do all the, May I speak candidly on this? Is this a, may I, Mr. President, I do all the shit you don't want to do, and I, t I tell you all the stuff everybody else is afraid to tell you that you don't want to hear. That's what a chief of staff does, and it's critical to have that. But to tell the president, Mr. President, if you do X, you run the risk of losing Y. That is something that needs to happen, and somebody is telling them that, okay? Mr. President, if you go on and do a debate, and you do this, 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 and this, it, it may sway this group of people, but won't sway that group of people. That's an honest answer, to your point, and that needs to happen. To go in and say, Mr. President, if you don't do this, you're going to lose is a complete waste of time. And those two things yeah. are different. You give the president the information, he makes the decisions. So who's giving him the honest advice at the moment? 
from the RNC, from, you know, in Friends. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it, uh, I know that Jared is, and I know that Bill Stepien is. Bill used to work uh, for me uh, in the yeah. West Wing. Um, really, really good uh, numbers guy, pollster guy, data-driven guy. That's why I like him. Um, and I'm, I'm satisfied that he's telling him exactly what he's seeing. And Mr. President, here's what we've got. Where do you want to go? Mr. President, you're, 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 you're down by two in Minnesota. You're up by one in Michigan. Where do you want to go? And the president decides what he wants to do. Um, but that's, 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 that's not telling the president what he wants to hear. That's telling the president the facts and letting him decide, which is what I think most good staffers, whether it's in the West Wing or on the campaign, um, should do. But no, I'm, 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 I'm comfortable that some of the, listen, the people in the office read the papers. We say that we don't, but we do. One of my favorite stories about the president is he, he called me one morning about 6 a.m. and says, Mick, 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 did you, did you see the New York Times this morning? I can't believe what they printed about me. That's terrible. You got to get that, you got to get, get, get that fixed. We can't, it's Mr. President. I haven't read the New York Times. Why not? You got to read the New York Times. It's the most edited, Mr. President. You told me to de cancel all the subscriptions. He goes, oh, oh yeah. We'll pick up a copy on the way to work. You know, so we say <laughs> that we don't read them, but we do. Um, so I know that message is getting through. And I know people say, Mr. President, we've got this polling data out of Arizona. We have other polling data that says something else. But yeah, he's seeing it all. He, listen, he says he only watches Fox. He watches all the, he, he consumes media um, from four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning until at least lunchtime every single day. He reads how, does he not, how does he not explode at the yeah. media? I mean, you know, uh, Washington Post, the New York Post, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal cover to cover every single day. Then he watches all of the morning programs. He is, he's one of the world's largest consumer of, of political news. Um, so he's, see, he's hearing all the same things that you've just talked about. So uh, Australians might not be uh, aware of it, but there's uh, a group of disgruntled Republicans who essentially out of the Bush campaign who um, formed a group called the Lincoln Project. And it's basically a super PAC that uh, has raised a lot of money. And it's saying we're Republicans, uh, don't vote for Donald Trump. And, but the ads are extraordinarily effective. I mean, they are, it's been going for a while. They're sniper shots. And half the ads are designed to get into Donald Trump's head and successfully yeah. <coughs> doing so, right? I mean, <clears throat> the ad, when uh, he parodied um, uh, Joe Biden as being old, uh, the Lincoln Project created an ad of Donald Trump walking gingerly down a ramp. And then they ran it in the middle of Hannity and uh, the programs they knew Donald Trump would do. And Donald Trump for a week reacted badly to the ads. And that increased the amount of money that the Lincoln Project was raising by about $2 million in 24 hours. So how significant, uh, how significant are these disgruntled Republicans getting out there? I mean, I haven't quite seen it like that before. It's full of venom, but it's really targeted, the Lincoln Project. Yeah, um, it is. It's, it's, it's probably taking it to new heights. Certainly, they've always been splinter groups in both parties. When you have a country of 330 odd million people and you only have two primary parties, there's never going to be, neither is monolithic. Um, you're seeing it amplified a little bit. Lincoln Project, certainly, again, I give them credit for doing what they've done because they've done it very well. Um, it exists within the Democrat Party now. You just don't, you just don't see it because the media doesn't give it any fuel and they don't put any money behind it. Um, but what I think you're seeing there is as much an establishment versus uh, anti-establishment, uh, you know, iconic, you know I, uh, icon versus iconoclast type of uh, type of debate. The folks who are doing this stand to lose if Donald Trump really does refashion Washington D.C. into something other than what it was before. Uh, face it, there's a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans who made a lot of money when George Bush. Uh, the first was president. He made a lot of money when Bill Clinton was president. Same was true with Bush the second and Obama. Um, and they're not making as much money now. But the, the Republican lobbying firms are not making as much money as they did under a previous Republican because they don't have the contacts within the Trump administration. Democrats, even centrist Democrats, they, they, they never get, they, they, get, they might have the ability to get in an office uh, of, of a George Bush appointee, but they're never going to get in the office of a Trump appointee. So there's that establishment versus anti-establishment sort of dynamic. That's not to downplay it. Listen, I got to give them credit where credit is due for, for what they've done and what the money they've, they've had a tremendous splash. They've got great sort of impact. I don't know if it's translated to votes because again, what you've just mentioned is it's, it's almost targeted at the president more than anybody else. Um, I've not seen any Lincoln Project ads back home in South Carolina. I saw them in Washington sure. all yeah, the yeah. time. So yeah, you yeah. just wonder how much of it is, is real and how much of it is just spite. Um, but uh, give credit where credit is due. Um, they've, uh, they've been very effective at times in attacking the president. 
Okay, so um, l let's get on to policies for a moment, and and I think we'll 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 deal with Donald Trump's forward agenda versus Joe Biden's forward agenda, and then okay. we'll get on to the Senate. Donald Trump's forward agenda. Nothing. I haven't heard any new policy initiatives. Uh, you know, in 2016, he said he was going to pull out of the TPP. You'd pull out of uh, out of Paris, move the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, he said he was going to build up the military, fix up veterans affairs, cut taxes, uh, build a wall. He had a big policy agenda, uh, deregulate and so on. The only one he didn't do was infrastructure, which we know. But, uh, and he couldn't repeal Obamacare, but he had a big policy platform. If you were to ask me, what is Donald Trump's one policy at the moment? I couldn't tell you for the next four years. Um, um, yeah, I think if I you ask him, something? yeah, if, I, I think if you asked him, you get a couple answers to that. First of all, uh, one of the answers is just more of the same. I think he would tell you, people know what I stand for. That I, I did it. I, I was a man of my word and I, I'm going to do more of the same. It's probably unsatisfying to folks who follow this but it does lead to my second point, which is that I'm not sure that that's what voters want to hear right now. Um, I, I think that, in fact, when I watch, Bi and I know, yeah, I'm biased. I get that. So I'm likely to look at a Biden ad and, and not like it. But when I see Joe Biden get up and say, I have a plan to cure COVID, no one believes that. No one believes that. In fact, Joe doesn't even believe that. We all know Joe doesn't believe it. He, he's saying it because that's what politicians say. I have a plan for this. I have a plan for that. It's not sure. going to happen. And I think if, if Trump went on TV and said, I have a plan to, to lower taxes, not if you don't win the House and the Senate, I think, I, I think he, would, he would be the first to tell you, that you and I have both done this because you know, we, we've been politicians and we've been ordinary people. I hate listening to politicians. I mean, ordinary politicians, I just do, because they all say the same thing, even sometimes from different parties. I, was, I used to laugh when Obama would give most of his, 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 his State of the Union speech, but 90% of it was acceptable to Republicans because it's all the same thing. It sounds the same as the speeches that George W. Bush gave in a lot of places. I think the president may think, because again, he's one of the best gut politicians I've ever seen, that this is not a policy election. This is a big picture, um, general direction type of election. And if he comes out and says, I'm gonna build another you know, 472 miles of wall between this date and that date, it's not gonna, no one's gonna care. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. People don't believe politicians anymore. Um, but that sort of makes him more of a cult leader than it does, you know, a, a person running for high office with a plan for the next four years. I mean, do, you know, Joe Biden has a number of policies. He's got the Building Better America, right? The Building Bigger America, yeah, which is the same as our, which is the same as our Make Make It in America program. It's the exact same. Yeah, you yeah. know that. It's the but, same. But, well, no, I don't accept that because it's two trillion dollar. Different other than, other than huge, other than even bigger government spending. What's the difference between build it better here and make it in America? Uh, well, the big renewable energy component. Okay, so green energy. You got us on that one. Yeah, yes, yeah, they, yeah, they're, so, they're better, yes. So we're better with fracking. Yeah, there you go. Boom. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah, for yeah. fracking. So, and you know, okay. Well, well, it, but it's but it's more than that. I mean, he's going to he's going to invest a lot in renewable energy. And, and, Just like you know, Obama bring. did. How did it, you know? And again, I get it, but I think people are tired of that. I just well, no, I don't think they're tired about it. I think they want to hear what you know an alternative is going to do. He's also well, going okay, to increase well, taxes. Okay, well, hold on a second. Well, hold on. If you're right, increase taxes. If you're right, and then if the if the voters are sitting there going, you know what, I, I really need to know what each of these people is going to do for the next four years, and I think you both agree that roughly half of them are going to vote for um, Donald Trump. We just give that right now, right? We'll just assume for sake of the discussion, it's a 50-50 election. Either Donald Trump has done a good job of articulating to those people what um, he's going to do in the next four years, and you've just missed it, or you're wrong about what people are interested in, because half the people in the country are going to vote for Donald Trump. Yeah, well, it might be the case. They're, they're voting. So it's a personality-based election. And, and, and what I'm getting I, to is, if it is personality-based, I mean, Donald Trump's energy uh, and... Um, and also the enthusiasm for him are a bigger driver. So what, so yeah. what it, it's coming back, there is no argument, I think, that the amount of energy behind Donald Trump is significantly more than the energy for Joe Biden. I mean, you know, I was here in 16, there were Hillary stickers everywhere all across the country, Hillary signs. I just don't feel the same energy for Joe Biden. I feel that the energy uh, is anti-Trump or it's yeah. pro-Trump. There's no... 
you know, there's, there's, and, and therefore Joe Biden can step back. Yeah. He can step back and but allow. He's, he's running. Know, he's running the exact race that he should be running. There's no question about it. Joe right. it's just very stands to lose. It is very disciplined. I no mean, one will benefit campaign. more. No, no one benefits more from COVID than Joe Biden because Joe Biden's most likely outcome, if he actually run a, a traditional campaign, was that he's he is famously gaff prone. He just is. And when you're gaff prone and you're in your late 70s, it does raise issues about whether or not you're capable of doing the job. And Biden's been able to avoid all of those. He's been very good in a lot of his public in a, a lot of his public uh, appearances recently. They can manage those a lot better. So listen, I don't fault him for running the election that he is, but he does not motivate people. And he doesn't motivate people, um, Joe, because it's not where his party is. The energy in his party is behind Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, That's yeah. just where the energy yeah. is. And Biden yeah. doesn't, doesn't draw on that. Those folks will show up and they'll vote up, they'll show because they hate Donald Trump, but they're not voting because they love and, and really are passionate about Joe Biden. And if, this is, if, if Trump does win by a very narrow margin, I think you could look to that as one of the reasons. Okay. I mean, we could go on about policies all day. I mean, if, if you, would you accept that there is a, if Joe Biden has a thumping victory, uh, then um, there's a very real chance that the Democrats can get the Senate as well as the House. Um, yeah, if it's a thumping victory, I think, yeah, I, I think that uh, w one of the things you notice about American politics is that the place where voters are most likely to split their vote is at the top of the ticket. So a Republican vote for president, a Democrat vote for Senate, or vice versa is much more common than, say, a vote for a Republican for president and then um, a Democrat for dog catcher. You just, you vote your party down the ballot, but you can vote more of the person and the personality up the ballot. So it's, it's not entirely fair to say that a, a thumping Biden win leads to a control of the Senate, but certainly if that's your assumption, that makes it more likely than not. Um, that being said, most of the races that I've heard about are extraordinary. But before we important. get onto the Senate, yeah. before we get onto the Senate, oh, okay. I do yeah. want to do a roll call of some of the key states in the presidential race. Okay, go ahead, um, fire away. Okay, so let, let's, let's, let's go through a few of them. Michigan, Trump won by less than 1%, currently down 7 Yeah, For, when we get to the Senate, I will explain to you why Trump is going to win Michigan, but go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Wisconsin, Trump won by less than 1%. He's down six um, percent. Despite my efforts, I think if I had to call it right now, I think that goes Biden. Right. Uh, Arizona, Trump won by four. Currently down yeah. three. I think I think Arizona is still Trump. Uh, if you want to ask me why on any of these, I can tell you. But keep going. Well, yeah. Well, no, no, no. If you think there's something that we need to know about Arizona, well, Arizona, go back to the polling I talked about, which is that the Trump, yeah. you, the poll you just messaged is the registered voters, right? Not likely yeah. voters. So. Yeah, that's well. Well, in some cases, it can be likely. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm taking it off the real clear politics average. Yeah. Um, oh, these two states that shouldn't be in play: Ohio and Iowa. Right. I mean, Ohio, Trump won by eight points, and he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's, it's too close to call. Yeah, and I think, um, I, I think again, if I had to pick out of the air, I think he wins Ohio. In fact, I think he doesn't win Ohio by eight, but he wins Ohio by five. Um, and I think Biden probably has a better chance in Iowa than he does in Wisconsin. Okay, in Nevada, he lost Donald Trump by 2.4. He's down five at the moment. I mean, that's yeah, very there, hard there's the state where I think those dynamics I told you about lead to a Trump victory. There's a third party balloting. Um, there's a departure from the state. There's a lack of a Democrat ground game, ground game, and the president has been there heavily. Now, two states we've talked about, North Carolina, where Trump won by four, and he's currently yeah. down two. Yeah, I think, I think North Carolina goes Trump. I think Pennsylvania is one of those ones that could actually come down to hundreds of votes different between the two. If those well, two Pennsylvania, votes. so Trump needs both Pennsylvania and Florida. Yeah, but you went Florida, Michigan, which, it's over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Florida, Michigan, so, it's over. Florida, Ohio, so, Michigan, it's over. So let's talk sorry, about Michigan for a second. Florida, Ohio, and Michigan. You, you, if, when, if he wins Florida, Ohio, and Michigan, he's going to win Florida. That's that's. But let's talk about Michigan for a second, because again, well, that's a big call on Florida. Just a second. That's a big call on Florida. I mean, it's always okay. you know, a few no, hundred it's votes. Not. Because you drill down into you drill down into the data, and what you see is that uh, Biden is underperforming Hillary Clinton by double digits amongst Hispanic voters. Yeah, but the so oldies are moving. If you go into polling, so okay, let, let's just note it. Simon, yeah. just note it. He calls Florida a thumping win for, for Trump. Okay. Let's, let's go to Michigan. You said that. 
So Trump here's won Mich- by less I, than seven. I, by less than one, and yeah, now he's so down 8, seven. 8,000 votes. So here's, here's the Michigan thing, and here's what I don't understand, because I've not been in Michigan, okay? So I, I'm not, I, you, you know as well as anybody, sometimes you just got to go. You got to feel it. You got to yeah, walk sure. around. You go to the airports, the train station. So I've not been to Michigan. What do I know about Michigan? There are three competitive, really competitive possible pickups for the Republicans in the Senate. Um, New Mexico is so one. So now we go into the Senate, yep. Well, I'm going to use, I'm going to use this as a, as a, to answer your question yeah. about the president. We come back and do Senate. Yeah. Michigan is, uh, uh, it's, it's Nevada, Minnesota, and Michigan. A buddy of mine is the candidate in Minnesota, and he said he's been, he was been trying to get Mitch McConnell to spend a bunch of money in, in Minnesota. And Mitch McConnell last week committed $10 million to John James, the African-American Republican candidate in Michigan. Yeah. I know Mitch McConnell. And as much as he and I have disagreed over the course of the last 10 years on policy and practice and so forth, he is not stupid. He's a really, really good political operator. He just is. He's one of the best in the business. There is no way he is spending $10 million in Michigan if he doesn't think he has a chance to win that state. And my guess is, and it's an educated guess, is what he looked at and said, I'm going to pick one of those three Senate races, because if I pick up one of those, the chances of my controlling the Senate go up dramatically. And I'm going to do it where I get two, two, I get, I get two bites at the apple for my money. I get it where I can help the president the most and help my Senate candidate at the same time. And the fact that he's spending $10 million in the last two weeks in Michigan tells me they think Michigan is in play both for the Senate candidate and for the president. That's why I give you the answer I give you. Okay, so um, just to cover some of the others, yeah. North Carolina, Tom Tillis, very unpopular. Cal Cunningham, sexting. Democrats yeah. sexting. Uh, Democrats my, guess winning. Is, my guess is a week, uh, two weeks ago, it was Democrats by a healthy margin. My guess is that if I had to gut that, and I live on the North Carolina, I'm from there. I live, I live in the North Carolina media market. I follow that race very closely, even though I live in a different state. Uh, my guess is Cunningham probably gets that one in a nail biter. The president wins North Carolina. And as they ha- as, as happened with their governor's race in 2016, the Republican governor of North Carolina lost re-election while Donald Trump won the state. That's unheard of. They did that because the candidate was just a bad candidate. I think Tillis has really struggled. The people who vote for Trump have never trusted Tillis, and Tillis has not been able to sort of mend the, that, that, that rift between Trump voters and his own voters. And I think Tillis is in trouble. Well, it wasn't unheard of because I'm going to go to Montana where the governor, Democrat governor, Steve Bullock, who's a mate of mine, um, won the state, the, 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 the governor's position, won, the, won that at the same time that Donald Trump won the state by 20. Yeah. But, you know, he's, he's very close against uh, Steve Daines. The, uh, yeah. The and there's a circumstance. You're right, the example you gave is the right one, which is, uh, as we mentioned before, that's the top of the ballot splitting that folks will do in the United States. They'll vote for one party for president, another for, for governor. But I really don't think that in a state where Trump is going to win by more than 20 points, which is what Montana is going to be, uh, that Steve Daines will lose. I think it'd be much closer. I think you might yeah. see Daines win by the low single digits, but I do not think that Trump wins by 20 and a Democrat wins Senate at the same time. Susan Collins in Maine. Yeah, I heard she's in Trump doesn't want to back. Yeah, I heard she's in trouble. Um, and um, I, I don't understand Maine. I don't understand Susan. I never did. Um, <laughs> I, I just I, I don't I don't I don't get it. I don't I don't know the state. They say it's fiercely independent. I get that. I like Angus King, the the other independent from Maine. He seems like you know he's a straight shooter. I enjoyed working with him during my confirmation process. Uh, Collins voted for me, so I just, I have to thank her for that. But I, I just don't get that race, and everybody tells me she's going to lose, and I have no reason to believe otherwise. Okay, two that are really interesting. Final two: Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah Lindsey's in trouble. Uh, it's going to be neck and neck, and I know I'd never, I never thought I'd say that in my home state, um, but Lindsey be the first to tell you that uh, that uh, he's behind uh, the president, and that's what we sort of look at. The president's going to win South Carolina by a high single digits, low double digits. So let's say the president wins by ten. Right now, Lindsey Graham is trailing the president by ten. Uh, Why? The Why is that? Been... Because he, he hitched to the president. He hitched to the president. He did, but he, he did is it now the, delivering the, the president's voters, nominee for the Supreme Court. Voters don't believe it. When, when Lindsey ran against Donald Trump for president, people forget that Lindsey ran for president in 2016. They also forget mm-hmm. Lindsey came in last in the South Carolina primary, or at least near last, in his home state. And he attacked Donald Trump mercilessly. And Trump voters remember that. And critically, the Democrats have had an outrageous sum of money, almost $100 million. Mm-hmm. Jamie Harrison, the Democrat candidate, raised more money in a quarter 
than any other Senate candidate in history against history. Lindsey Graham. And they're able to sort of educate Trump voters that, hey, go ahead and vote for Trump, but don't vote for Lindsey Graham. And when you have that type of message and the money to back it up with, you can make hay uh, even in a, in a state where Donald Trump is going to win. So that's, that race is going to be extraordinarily close. My guess is at the end of the night, Lindsey wins by low single digits, two or three points, just because enough people who vote for Trump don't want to see a Democrat Senate and losing South Carolina would make a difference. Okay, Simon, over to you. For any other <laughs> Good on you. This has been a fantastic conversation, guys. And I do, I'm mindful of everybody's commitments at the top of the hour. So we will end promptly at the top of the hour. I do want to get in a, a few policy questions to, to, to Mick and in particular, and that is, you know, look, as you would both know so well, China is topic number one, two, and three in government yeah. to government conversations between Australia and the United States. Um, tremendous interest here in what the policy settings might look like under a second Trump administration or a Biden administration, a little bit of scene setting just to inject into that before I ping on that, Nick, and that is Trump seems outrageously angry with China over COVID. Um, is that going to translate into policy action either in a lame duck in the event of Trump losing, perhaps, or, you know, in the second Trump administration, perhaps on the Biden administration, question number one in the Australian <clears throat> pardon me, strategic affairs community is probably NATO are going to come knocking big time, uh, looking for a renormalization of alliance relationships and whatnot. Does that pull the United States away from the Indo-Pacific or has there been enough change in the DC strategic affairs mindset about the urgency of the China challenge? Yeah, let me answer the second question first, which is no, I think we'll, you'll continue to see what Obama termed the pivot to Asia and so forth. Um, it's one of the reasons I enjoyed working with Joe when he was still, you know, uh, making an honest living. Um, and that was because <laughs> Australia will continue to rise in their importance to us as a strategic ally, as a friend, uh, as a partner in so many different things. And I think you'll see us continue to build relationships with Japan. Uh, I spoke to an Indian American group today. Um, you know, the president has done outreach to M Mr. Modi. I don't know the president's relationship with the new Japanese prime minister because I've not been there. Um, but you continue to see this focus on Asia, and I think rightly so. Let me deal with the, your first question now, and let me be clear in saying that I have, this is, this is educated guessing. I've not talked to the administration about what their policy will be moving forward, but this is my gut feel from knowing a lot of the players in Washington, D.C., which is the policy will not be markedly different under a Biden administration or a Trump administration. And that is because this distrust of China is now, down, now uh, bipartisan. And while folks were, were really interested in a trade deal before, especially Republicans, keep, keep in mind, in our, in our country, the last generation, Republicans have been the free traders and Democrats have been the protectionists. And then yeah. Donald Trump comes in and sort of sets that on his ear. And now you've got to the point where uh, a skeptical view of China is shared across party lines. And don't forget, uh, and especially we are uh, the legislation that allows, that, the legislation that, that manages how we approve trade deals is up for renewal in the summer. It's assumed that it gets renewed. That will mean that the House of Representatives will continue to play a dramatic role in approving any trade deals. They have to vote, they have to vote these things up or down. So it's not just the administration anymore. Yes, the administration negotiates, but the Senate and the House still have to give it an up or down vote, which means you have to get through those, those passions there's a reason in our, in our structure, the House is elected every single two years. Our founding fathers wanted them to represent the passions of the people. The Senate, with the longest term of any elected body, six years in the world, is supposed to be the great cooling saucer where those passions cool down. But you have to deal with those passions. And right now, the passions are anti-China, not just because of trade, not just because of the impact on our manufacturing, not just because of intellectual property theft and, and, and not playing you know, by the rules, but COVID has certainly uh, exacerbated that. And I think that's bipartisan at this rate. Would, you, would the style be different? Sure, Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump are two different people. At the end of the day, um, do I think you're still going to see a more skeptical view of China coming out of Washington, D.C., regardless of who's in the Oval Office? Yes, I do. Uh, that's terrific. I, I want to bring in um, Gordon Flake, the CEO of the Perth U.S. Asia Center. Gordon, going to join us briefly live to put a question. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks. Good to see you again. Um, um, thank you. This was a fascinating hour. I wonder if I might ask you a personnel kind of question. You, you referred to the, the Lincoln Project folks as a splinter group. 
Uh, yet today, you've seen now over 700 former Republican national security officials endorse Joe Biden. Two yeah. former heads of the Republican National Committee endorse him. The yeah, question well, I have well, for you, one of them is Michael Steele, by the way. So yeah. let's be careful about that. And for those of you who don't know, Michael Steele is the one who sold his soul to MSNBC. You can make a lot of money in this country by going on television to beat up as a former Republican. So let's take take so a look at that. Even, with even if you take out Michael Steele, you're still left with you know 800 in that, that field. Yeah. The question I really have for you is, as chief of staff, I mean, obviously you had to deal with staffing out an administration. Uh, and we're now going into a scenario where you think the president's going to win. If he does win, does the Republican Party now have the manpower, you know, to staff up a oh, second term? Yeah, that's a great question. A great question. Um, and thank you for that. I didn't know that was going to be the question. So here's my answer to that, which is I think the, I think the, the team is stronger in the second term. And here's why. Hmm. Is that the president's greatest strength was also his greatest weakness. And that is that he was not familiar with Washington, D.C. We talk another time about how, why that was such a strength of his, but it was a weakness in terms of identifying people that could work with him um, that would help him implement his, his agenda. And the example I give of making a, a, a bad decision on that was John Bolton. He didn't know John Bolton. He saw John Bolton was on Fox TV. You know, I like the guy. I want to have somebody disagree with me. It's not people who are going to uh, sycophants were just there to, to reaffirm the president. He wanted to have, he hired me for the budget office because I'm a lot more fiscally conservative than he was. But you also, at the end of the day, have to have people who are willing to put their own agenda aside once the president has decided to push the president's agenda. And John Bolt was not capable of doing that. A lot of folks in the national security area are not because they just fundamentally disagree with the president's sort of non-interventionist policy. Keep in mind, his, his, his policies on war in Afghanistan is much closer to, to, to Brand Paul's uh, who's, uh, who's a non-interventionist than it was to, to, to John Bolton. So I think now that the president has sort of taught himself how to find people who disagree with me, but still at the end of the day can still be on the team. Mike Pompeo disagrees with the president all the time. He does it in private. And when the decision is made, he's on the team. Steve Mnuchin will give the president different opinions all the time. These are really, really good members of the cabinet. And I think you'll see him build on that type of experience as opposed to recreate some of the mistakes he had in hiring folks like Bolton and Kelly, uh, Sessions and Tillerson. Dr. Thank Flynn. you. Um, the, I guess the, um, <clears throat> the other question, Mick, I'd like to put to you is, um, is there, with that kind of that settling or that maturation, if you will, perhaps of, of some of the team around Donald Trump in a second term, is there any opening towards I know there's only one, my joke used to be, there's only one thing more distasteful than China and Washington at the moment, that's multilateralism, but, but things like TPP, things like those agreements that are very much assessed to be in Australia's national interest if the US were to, to play a role in them, still sort of on the nose with the, in the second Trump administration, or does that second term create some political yeah. space for finding a way back at all? Well, certainly the president's always open for debate. There's no question about it. Some of the best debates I've ever had in my entire life in the Oval Office were in the Oval Office over trade. I mean, early in the days you had Gary Cohn at CEA and then you, a big free trader. And then you had Larry Kudlow, who's still a big free trader, Steve Mnuchin, very much, excuse me, a free trader. And then you have Peter Navarro and, and Wilbur Ross on the other side. And so those debates will continue. So the arguments will be made, Mr. President, here's why we should join TPP or here's why we should look at this multilateral agreement. And other sides will, will make the same uh, arguments to make now. And I think if, if I find it, the center of gravity right now is on bilateral agreements, not on multilateral. Um, we, the president seems to think, and Bob Lighthizer, I think, shares this, this predilection that the multi, we, we seem to give away something to everybody in multilateralism and don't, and don't get something from everybody. And we'd be better off doing one-off types of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of deals. Um, it's why I think you're seeing us throw such heavy energy right now into a US-UK deal. Um, which I think you'll see early in, early in the next year, uh, just as soon as the, as the Brits cut their, their agreement with the, uh, with the Europeans, which I do think will happen. We didn't get a chance to talk about that tonight, but that's okay. Um, so I, I don't see a big change uh, if, the, if Trump wins, uh, but certainly the debate will continue uh, full-throated. Okay, Mick and Joe, I promised you I would end sharply at the top of the hour, given we are talking about uh, just hours left <laughs> really in this campaign. Um, we are. I got one more event hour. tonight. So yeah, we're going off. We're doing. We got. We got one more Catholics for Trump event here in Pennsylvania tonight. So. Yeah, extraordinary. Uh, I uh, I can only imagine. Uh, kind of wish I was there. <laughs> um, um, but thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, and um, and Joe, uh, 
thank you so much for bringing Mick on. I had the pleasure of spending a little bit of time uh, with a glass of red wine in hand up at White Oat, um, where that, that friendship was forged. And uh, as I said, continues to serve Australia's national interest exceptionally well. Long may it continue. Uh, <laughs> uh, th thank you both gentlemen. Uh, Thanks, my wine cellar has deteriorated. It's not yeah. the same as it was. <laughs> All the wine is still pretty good. So yeah. and the Irish yeah. whiskey is a lot yeah. better. Joseph, I'll see you on Friday for golf. Great. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> good night, guys. Thank you, everybody.